Thank you for welcoming each other this morning. I want to encourage you to try and find your seat as soon as you can, if you would. It is so good to be back. Last Sunday we were uh, down in our, my hometown of Farmington for Darla's mom's birthday, and we moved Mark and Ruth Ann into a brand new place they just purchased. But hey, this, this Saturday, I just want to inform you of a special day. Again, this Saturday, somebody in our church is having a birthday, and Dorothy Nichols is going to be 98 on Saturday. <laughs> Happy birthday, Dorothy. <clears throat> wow, you are amazing. Yeah. You are, God is good. God is, we love you, Dorothy, so much. and are so grateful to you and all your prayers for us. If you want prayer, talk to Dorothy, and she'll get you on her list, and you'll never get off, and you'll have an amazing woman praying for you. So you just let her know what your prayer requests are, and uh, she's got this really, it's like a red phone connection to God, you know, like, it just he, just, he just picks it up really quick. So, no, we love you, Dorothy. I pray that you have a very happy birthday on Saturday. And many, many more. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Uh, there was a husband who took his young daughter uh, to the grocery store to have her help him buy some groceries. Well, in addition to the healthy items on his wife's carefully prepared list, the two of them returned home with one of those big bags of, of M&M's. His wife said, why did you buy this? You know M&M's aren't good for you. Well, the husband said, well, don't worry. This bag of M&M's has one-third less calories than usual. Well, the wife began looking over the bag, and she says, well, what makes you think there are one-third less calories than usual in this bag? Well, the husband says, well, we ate about a third of the bag on the way home. So there's one third less calories as usual. How many of you have ever heard the expression, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak? We all have areas in our lives where the flesh is weak. Since the fall of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, temptation has been a constant for all of us. Mankind has tried to avoid it, resist it, ignore it, or just given in to it. But no person has ever found a place or a circumstance that can totally make them safe from temptation. This morning we're going to look at Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 to 11. It's one of those monumental and mysterious spiritual battles. I mean, if you if you look at battles, you might think back to, you know, the Star Wars or, or Rocky movies or things like that, some epic battles that take place. This is an incredible battle. And as we're approaching the weeks prior to, to Easter and Resurrection Sunday, I want to focus a little bit on some things that tie into that. Now, you may wonder, well, why, why would the story, this is the story of, of Jesus in the wilderness and when he was tempted. You might say, well, what's that got to do with Easter? Friends, it's all a part of the spiritual battle that takes place for Jesus Christ, God in the flesh on our earth, in our earth. Now, uh, the devil's temptations directed at Jesus in the wilderness of Judea were observed by no other human beings at all. He was entirely alone, and therefore we understand and realize that Jesus himself must have shared this experience with his disciples. Otherwise, nobody would know about this. And there's a reason he shared that with his disciples, because he wanted them to know how they could resist and overcome the enemy's attacks in their life. And that's why it's written for us today, is so that we also can know that there is a way out of temptation. There is a way for us to be victorious over the enemy's attacks and temptation. Now, the encounter with Satan occurred immediately after Jesus' baptism, where the Father proclaimed out of heaven in Matthew 3.17, This is my Son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. So the purpose for Matthew recounting this event is to demonstrate the pattern of Jesus' victory over temptation, over sin, a pattern that Jesus, again, desires us to also know and to experience in our lives. 
So the encounter that Matthew describes can be divided really into three parts. There would be number one, the preparation, and then there's the temptation that takes place, and finally there's the triumph of Jesus over the enemy. So let's look at the preparation first, and that's found in verse one and two. Uh, you know, the goal of, of and the aim of all believers is, is to please God. We want to please, please him in every area. And yet we, we know that pleasing him, we need to be obedient to him. We need to walk in faith with him. And yet there are times that we all get tripped up. And so there's some great things that we can learn here in our life that will help us on our journey of pleasing God. Um, in verse number one, it says, Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the desert to be tempted by the devil. Even with Jesus, it seems that, that after victory comes temptation. Have you ever noticed that? It seems like after an incredible moment with God, or when God just touches you, speaks to you, something incredible happens, it seems like it's not long before a battle ensues and the enemy attacks. And that's what's happening here with Jesus as well. After the victory of Jesus' baptism and, and this word from his father comes this test in the wilderness. See, the devil's purpose is to frustrate the plan of God and to usurp the place of God. Yet God often uses Satan's tempting to evil as really he's going to bring out a, a, a testing that's going to be for good. What Satan intended to lead the son into, sin and disobedience, the father used to demonstrate the son's holiness and his worthiness. James 1, verse 2 to 4 says, Consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. None of us like those times, and yet those times can be uh, times where we have pure joy as we resist and we find that we conquer over the enemy. In verse 2, we read an understatement of Jesus back in Matthew 4 of his physical condition, which he underwent during this time of testing. It says, after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. You think? I mean, you, some of you are hungry already this morning. You had breakfast, but even right now, your stomach is grumbling and complaining, and you're thinking, where am I going to eat today? Or maybe you've got the roast that's already cooking, and you can't wait to get home. Hunger. It says he was hungry, and again, 40 days of, of fasting. This is a supernatural fast. This is the, of God. No water, no food. He should be dead. Years ago, when I first began pastoring here, after a couple years of that, I, I went into a time of fasting for 40 days. Mine wasn't like this fast. I had some juice, but, but Jesus was like nothing, a supernatural fast, and so he was hungry. Um, it, it may be that he was so caught up in his communion with the Spirit, with the Father, that maybe he didn't notice he was hungry for most of those days. But you know, hunger not only makes us physically weak, but also tends to weaken our moral and spiritual resistance as well. When we're tired, when we're hungry, when we're sick, we tend to be vulnerable to anything that might provide release from the distress of what we're going through. And Satan may attack more fiercely during times of weakness, during unawareness or unpreparedness. Temptation that has, um, excuse me, temptations that have been anticipated, guarded against, and prayed about have less power to harm us. So here is Jesus in this incredible time with God, having spent this, these moments with the Lord, and he is prepared. And yet he is hungry. He is vulnerable in many ways as well. Now fasting is a form of self-discipline. And I encourage you to, to have that as a part of your spiritual life. To give up food or, or water for a time. If you can, if you don't have anything like diabetes or something like that. I encourage you to go into those times periodically as the Lord would lead you to do. Obviously a lot of people during this season of Lent uh, are, are giving up something. Some of them are fasting. 
Uh, some of them, you know, might give up chocolates or whatever. I don't know. But I encourage you periodically throughout the year to have those, those meals or those days, those maybe even a week or so, where you are going into fasting and, and just see what God begins to do as he works through you. Now, Satan was trying to gain a foothold into, into Jesus' life, trying to, in a sense, trip him up at what could have been his physically weakest moment. So at the end of the 40 days, when Jesus would have been hungry and tired, as, as any of us would be, the devil goes after him. And that's how the devil is with us as well. He waits until we're tired, we're weary, and we're discouraged, and then he comes after us with big guns. You know, you come home after a hard day of work, and your wife says, honey, I wish you would put your laundry in the hamper instead of leaving it all over the floor. And you're like, well, what happened to the word hello? Why are you hitting me with this? I'm tired. I'm just coming home from a hard day of work. And she says to you, well, what do you think I've been doing? I don't want to come home from work and look at your messy clothes all over the place. And just like that, Two Christian people who love each other are duking it out like rock'em, sock'em robots. The devil's strategy is to hit the people of faith when they're tired and weary. And that's what he was doing to Jesus. So let's look at this story. In verses 3 to 10 is what we're going to cover today. Uh, number one, the, the, well, the temptations. Let's look at the temptations. Jesus, Satan came at Jesus really in three different areas. Three different temptations for three needs overcome by three different answers from Jesus. So most people forget that it is not a sin to be tempted. Do you realize that? It is not a sin to be tempted. All of us get tempted in something. It's what you do the moments after that temptation comes that can lead you into sin. You've heard it said that you can't help if a bird lands on your head, but you can't prevent him from making a nest there, right? The same idea with temptation. You can't help when that thought comes or when this temptation comes. But what is it that you do with it after that has come to you? So, need number one, the devil trying to use the real physical need of hunger to tempt Christ into succumbing to temptation to turn stones into bread. It says, if you are, that was the challenge. Prove himself. If you are the Son of God, See, Satan wanted to twist the divine mission of the Son of God. What kind of Messiah will you be? Use your supernatural powers for your physical needs. Now, if you turn rocks into bread, people will follow you. All you need to do is save them from hunger. Meet their legitimate human needs. It was a temptation to act independently from God to act supernaturally to meet his needs instead of depending on God to meet those needs. Would Jesus use his position? Would he use his authority for selfish needs? Would Jesus use his power for selfish needs? Now the devil wanted to raise some doubts in our Lord's mind. He wanted Jesus to say, well, I haven't eaten for 40 days. Is God ever going to come through for me? Can I trust him? Is he going to be there for me when I need him? Am I going to have to act on my own will or my own power? Or will I follow God and depend on him to meet my needs, however pressing they may be? Many of you have to go through the same thing every day. Will I act on my own power or will I trust God to be the one that's going to meet my needs? You see, Satan, get this, Satan often uses a legitimate need but tempts us by seeking to fulfill that need in an illegitimate way. The need for love. It's a need we all have. But Satan will often use that need to get us on a path to fulfill that need in a way that isn't God's plan versus trusting God to be the one that fulfills that need. Now look at Christ's response in verse four. He answered and said, it is written, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. So the, the Lord answers the devil's temptations 
with the word of God. Jesus insisted that people need more than bread for their life. See, we need him. We need him. We need that word of God, to know that word of God. When the temptation comes, we know what the word says. We know how to come against that. We know that we're dependent on him. Look at Matthew 6, says, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Don't try to meet a legitimate need in an illegitimate way. Allow God to be the one that meets that need. Psalm 119, verse 9 and 11 says, how can a young man keep his way pure? By keeping it according to your word. Your word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against you. Friends, I want to encourage you, not just get yourself into the word so that you're strong, but memorize the word. And I know that gets harder as we get older, doesn't it? It, it does. It's, just, it's a battle to try and stick more stuff in there, and then once it's in there, to find where it went. But I want to encourage you to work at it, to really try it. Teach your kids when they're young, grandparents. Teach them the word of God when they're little When you're on watch, when you have them at your home, when you're taking care of them, don't just watch the movie. Teach them some of the word of God. Share with them about your life. Invest in them when they're young. Help them memorize the word. For Jesus to turn stones into bread would have been to place personal physical needs ahead of obedience and trust in God. I want to encourage you to trust in him reprioritize some things so that you're trusting in him. Number two, temptation two is self-accomplishment. Satan's next strategy to get Jesus to focus on uh, the attention on himself instead of upon God. He wants Jesus to rationalize and compromise and attempt to to complete God's purpose in the wrong way. In verse five and six, we read of this miraculous transportation of Jesus to the temple in Jerusalem. And verse five says, then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. And again, he said, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you and they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against the stone. So the devil takes a beautiful verse about trusting God and he twists it into an invitation to test God. Jesus, you say that not, by not turning the stones into bread that you are trusting God, now publicly demonstrate that trust in God by jumping and letting people see your trust and God's promise protection. So Satan takes a verse out of context. He actually omits a part of it from Psalm 91, 11 and 12. He twists it to get it to say something that God never intended it to say. And he does that with us as well. He'll twist scripture. He'll try to get us to think, oh, maybe God's meaning this. And he'll try to get us off the path. Now, there's a lot of people at the temple at this time. Jesus could have popularized himself throughout this incredible display of of these angels would come and, and kind of catch him before he would actually hit the ground. They would supernaturally provide for him this protection. And what would the people think when they all saw this? It'd be amazing. Many of the battles that we find ourselves in are over some of the similar things that, that Jesus was finding a battle in when he was encountering Satan in the wilderness. Satan will try and come and, and focus or get us out of focus trying to cause the word, the will, or the way of God to become fuzzy, to become unclear, so that he can get us sidetracked. And Satan will offer you an alternative to God's word, to his will, to God's way. And he will try to get you to think that you are still following God, even though you've gotten sidetracked. The second temptation is about the plan that God has for you. See, God has a purpose for every single one of your lives. God has a plan for you. God has designed you, and he is trying to mold you 
for his purpose. When following his word, his will, and way in your life, when you do that, it will turn out for the best. But he tries to, Satan tries to sidetrack us from the word, from the will, from the way of God, and he tries to even get us to think, you know what, it's okay. I can just do this, even though it's not a part of his plan, and I'm still gonna be okay. And we begin to settle for second, third, or fourth best, or even something far further down the road. We have this longing to be loved, and we meet somebody, and maybe we're even struggling financially. So what does that longing do? It gets us to say, you know what, it'd be, it'd be smart and wise if we wouldn't just live together. We should just do that. And then that leads to other things that are outside of God's plan. And we think that we're fulfilling ourselves, we're, I'm getting love, and I'm also uh, being smart financially because we're not using two incomes for, or our incomes for two different places, and suddenly we find ourselves outside of God's plan for our life, even though we can justify it by twisting some of the things that are in scripture. See, God's plan for you is what's best for you. He wants you to overcome, and the way we do that is by knowing the word of God. So when temptation comes, we're able to stand up like Jesus and say, ah, it is written. This is what God says. This is what his plan is. Once again, in verse seven, Jesus turns to the Old Testament scripture for a wise response. Jesus answered him, it is written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. These words come from Deuteronomy 6, 16, and refers back to the time when Moses struck the rock in order to get water to satisfy the grumbling Israelites. Because God did not immediately meet their expectations, they questioned his leadership and his faithfulness. Faith is simply trusting God and taking him at his word no matter what our circumstances or trials. We are not to try and force God's hand, but simply take God's hand and follow him. Now Jesus quoted scripture, but it wasn't his ability to quote scripture that gave him the victory. He quoted scripture to let Satan know he was committed to obey the scriptures. We can know things, but we're not follow them. Don't just quote but say, I'm following God's plan for my life, Satan. Get out of here. Number three is self-glorification. Having failed in the first two attempts, Satan came blatantly at Jesus. In verses eight and nine, again it says, again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All this I will give you if you will bow down and worship me. Satan often comes to us that way. I'll give you this. I'll give you that. If you'll just do this, you'll have that. If you'll just do this. Now, from the vantage point of a mountain, Satan gave Jesus a vision of all the great kingdoms of this world. I don't know how that happened, but it was kind of a supernatural thing uh, as it looked into the, probably the spiritual realm. And there, Satan displayed the, the wonders of the earthly kingdom, and he offers them to Jesus. Now, later Jesus would call Satan the ruler of this world in John 14, 30. And the apostle John stated that the entire world is under the power of the evil one in 1 John 5, 19. So apparently at this time it seemed that, that Satan really had the right to be able to, to give them to Jesus. God has also promised Jesus a kingdom. But these kingdoms would require the shame and suffering of the cross. So Jesus is faced with this age-old temptation that the end justifies the means. The way of obedience is long, it can be hard, it can be difficult. Why not make a deal with the prince of this world? Why not compromise to obtain the desired end immediately? The price of immediate possession was simply bowing the knee in compromise before Satan. Instead of enduring the long, the bitter, the humiliating and painful road to the cross, an even longer wait in heaven for God's time to be completed when Jesus would rule and reign in this earth. Satan always comes at us that way. He suggests that the world of business, the world of politics or fame, the world of whatever our hearts desire can be ours 
if only. We can get what we want. We can fulfill our lusts and our fantasies. We can be somebody. All we must do to get those things of the world is to go after them in the way of the world, which is Satan's way. He tempts each one of us in the same way. Why set your standards so high? What's the use? You can get what you want by cutting a corner here or there. Shade the, shade the truth a little bit. Why wait for heavenly reward when you can have what you want now? When we set our hearts on money, on prestige, on popularity, on power, on selfish happiness, we are doing exactly what Satan wanted Jesus to do, to put self first. Jesus' response was straightforward and clear. In verse 10, Jesus stood up in the spirit and using scripture, Jesus said, away from me, Satan, for it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. You see, friends, there can be no compromise with the devil. Referring, referring again to the word of God as Jesus' ultimate authority, he quotes Deuteronomy 6.13. See, God's word is the final argument, the ultimate authority that you have against the enemy. And Ephesians calls the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Every once in a while, I come across a story that I think, this is crazy. Is this story real? Would people really do that? And I verify these stories. And in fact, this story has happened multiple times. I've read multiple stories of something like this. So there's this family living in Florida. And they decided it would be really kind of cool to have this little baby Burmese python. But this Burmese python never came with any warnings or instructions at all. It should have. This family living in Oxford, Florida, brought that serpent home as a pet but they would soon live to regret their decision. The snake, now no longer a baby, but 12 feet long, broke out of the glass aquarium during the night. It silently began to slither into the bedroom of their two-year-old girl. It wrapped itself around her defenseless body, and it strangled her to death. A horrible, yet totally preventable tragedy. I want to tell you this morning that Satan, the old serpent, works the same way. He works tirelessly to try and get us to believe that allowing him into the home is no danger at all. It's just a little thing. It's going to be okay. It's just a pet. You'll be fine with this thing. After all, it's behind the glass. It's in a cage. We know, not, we know how to control him. But I can tell you this morning, a snake is a snake. And some of us have allowed things into our life that we've not resisted. We've not come against it with the word of God. And it's wormed its way into our lives and pretty soon we don't know life without it and we just kind of settle for, well, that's just the way it is and it'll be okay and the Lord understands and all these things. But friends, sin is sin and the wages of sin is death. God doesn't want you being controlled by the enemy. He doesn't want you falling to temptation. And we know that when we do, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus himself, who is for us. In fact, Jesus modeled to us what we can be. We can be triumphant. Look at verse number 11, the triumph. It says, then the devil left him and the angels came and attended him. See, because Satan's present power is only, in a sense, it, God does allow uh, some of these trials to come, but, but he has always given us a way of escape when it comes to temptation. And so after Satan left, angels came and, and ministered unto Jesus. Friends, nobody desires your joyfulness in life more than God himself. 
And some people think that when he puts a, a restrictions on us, don't do this, don't do that, it's because he doesn't want us to have fun. God's a killjoy. No fun at all. Christians are just boring. Man, if you are following Jesus, it should be nothing even close to boring. As God is working through you in supernatural ways. But look at Matthew 7, verse 11. It says this. If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? Why do we settle for less? God wants to give you joy and peace and strength and wisdom and all these incredible things. And yet so often in our life, we give in to what seems to be easy. And we go down this path that leads to destruction. The great news is that Jesus has come. And Jesus kicked the devil's butt that day. <laughs> And it wasn't too many years later that he kicked it again for good, man. I mean, and, and, and back in the end times, he's gonna kick it for once and for all. But friends, we're on the winning team. We don't have to give in to the temptations. God wants you to win. God wants you to overcome. And we can do that as we walk with him in the spirit, as we understand what the word of God says, and we begin living it out. I wanna encourage you today that you can be victorious. Whatever might be gripping you today, Satan can't keep you gripped in it because you know the way out is through Jesus. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. And now we have the word of God this morning to live by that word. Friends, I wanna encourage you to walk the way that Jesus did, to resist the enemy and he will flee. Would you bow your heads with me this morning? As we live in this world, we know that we're gonna have temptation every day. And again, it is not a sin to be tempted. But all too often, especially when we may feel weak, sick, whatever, kind of slide into those things, say, ah, oh, it's just easier to give in. It'd be more convenient just to do this or that. But friends, God has a plan for you that's far above what the enemy would have planned for you. The Bible says he, Jesus has come to give you life and more abundantly. But Satan comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. Friends, I want to follow Jesus. And I desperately need him every single day to help me overcome. And when I do fall, when I do mess up, I don't run away from God in embarrassment, in shame, and in guilt. The Holy Spirit convicts and he draws us back in to the loving arms of God. And some of you that are here this morning, you have spent a time running from God because you have felt guilty about the things that you've done. And that's exactly where the enemy wants you to be. This morning I want to encourage you to run into the loving arms of Jesus. Let him love on you. The Bible says, even while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He doesn't wait for us to change, but we have to come to him. And when we come to him, he helps us to overcome the battles the same way he did when being tempted in the wilderness. He gives us the tools. He gives us the Holy Spirit to empower us. He doesn't leave us as helpless little lambs because he is a good shepherd that cares for the sheep when under attack. This morning, you may be here thinking, Pastor Keith, boy, I, I don't even know this Jesus. But there's something in my heart that I just, there's a yearning in my heart to, to know him. And, and I need to be forgiven of the things that I've done that are wrong. Jesus is here this morning to do that. He's already paid the price for your forgiveness. It's just in your hands now if you'll receive what he's already done for you. And with every head bowed and every eye closed this morning, I wonder if there'd be somebody here today that you wanna say yes to Jesus for the very first time. It's not about religion. It's not about good works. It's about Jesus and what he's done for you and you accepting that and then you giving your life to him every day, living for him? Is there anyone here this morning that by raising your hand, you're saying, Pastor Keith, I wanna give my heart to Jesus. 
I'm not going to call you forward, but I am going to lead us all in a prayer. If there's anyone here this morning, you want to say yes to Jesus. You've filled your life with everything else you've tried, but you're still empty inside. Only Jesus can fill that. Is there anyone here this morning? Just going to wait a moment longer. On this next question, I want to encourage everyone again to have your heads bowed and your eyes closed. We're not here to advertise the wrongs and all those things, although the Bible clearly says that we should confess our sins to one another, and that's just so we have accountability and help. But this morning, if you're here and, and feeling like you've been giving the devil a foothold in an area of your life, and maybe you've yielded to temptation and you're, just, you're tired of that, that thing in your life, you're tired of that area always getting victory over your life, and you're saying, God, I want to I overcome in a specific area where I feel like the devil's been beating me up in that area. I want to be stronger. I want to know what the word says so I can overcome the enemy. I need the spirit of God to help me resist temptation. If you have an area like that, and again, I'm not going to call you forward and publicly display what's going on. This is you know, something that all of us will, may struggle with at time to time, but if that's you and you just really need a victory in an area this morning, would you raise your hand with nobody's looking around this morning? Yes, thank you, thank you. There are many, many hands that are up. Again, this is be real with God. See, we're never gonna get over some of those hurdles, some of those things that Satan puts there if we're not willing to admit that they're there. And then if we're not really to, to call on the name of the Lord and recognize he's the one that's gonna help you overcome this morning. He's the one that's gonna give you victory. I wanna encourage you, let's just stand this morning. There's many, many hands that are, that are up this morning. And... Uh, you can come forward for prayer this morning. You don't have to, but I want to pray with you. This is something that I know every single one of us faces every single day. In fact, if you're breathing, you're facing temptation. If you're breathing, the enemy is after you. If you're a follower of Christ, he is attacking you. It's not a matter of if he attacks or not, he attacks. So what are we going to do about it? Are we going to fall into those lies again and again and again? Or are we going to recognize that putrid smell of his breath and recognize where these things are coming from and begin to walk in victory and begin to walk in the ways the Lord has for us and not let the devil rob us of our joy in serving Jesus and not let the devil tear our marriages apart, our relationships apart. God has victory in, in mind for you and he modeled how to overcome the enemy in these verses this morning. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, in this moment, we want to just be real with you. And Lord, even that while I'm preaching, just, just feeling a battle that's taking place. And maybe even things, my words, not even coming out clearly. And I believe that's all a part of the enemy doesn't like this topic at all. He doesn't like us as believers walking in freedom and joy and overcoming and he doesn't like it when even if we, we sin here and there, he doesn't like us repenting and, and, and coming to the heart of the Father and making things right. And he just wants to keep us following after these things and getting further and further from God. And so God, we just come before you as real as ever and say that we need you this morning. God, we need your help. We need the Spirit of God helping us to overcome these temptations. And Lord, there are some here this morning that are, are truly bound by things that maybe have been there for years. And this morning they have recognized what it is. They have recognized that it is simply a, a, a smoke screen that Satan has put there to try and get them to believe this is the best path for their life. But Lord, this morning they recognize this is not the plan that God has for me. And Lord, this morning as we repent of those things, we come to the heart of God. We come to the foot of the cross and ask you to help us, Lord, to forgive us and strengthen and empower us to walk in the strength that the Lord provides for us. And God, I pray that we would be a people that would not just hear scripture on Sunday morning, 
but we would take time on a daily basis to feed our spirit and to know what the Word of God says. So the next time the enemy comes, and he will, we'll be able to stand strong against him. And we will be able to resist, and we will be able to quote the Word of God. And Lord, knowing that, he is going to flee because he has to flee because of what you've done on the cross. Father, I pray that this week we would walk in victory. I pray that this week we would be overcomers. I pray this week you would give us divine appointments with those who don't yet know Christ. God, that we would not look at them as enemy, but we would recognize they are blinded by Satan, that they cannot see where they're going and what they're doing. But God, I pray that you would use us in a very loving way Share with them about the hope through Jesus Christ. Lord, I thank you that we are on the winning team, that we can walk in victory every single day because greater is he that is in us than he that is in this world. Father, bless your people as we go this morning, not from your presence, but out walking in the presence of the Lord, living it out every day, Lord. We pray this in Jesus' awesome name. Amen and amen. Before you go, recognize there are signups today for life groups. Also, today is the last day to sign up for the father-daughter banquet that is just around the corner in two weeks. So you need to sign up and pay for that. God bless you. Have a great, victorious day today.